This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Andreas Pompandreou, professor of economics at York University, Toronto, and a former official in his father's Greek government, lectures on the political situation in Greece. Mr. Pompandreou. I am very pleased to be in Iowa State today. I had visited uh, this campus as an economist some 22 years ago. And I remember in those days that it was a much smaller campus with much fewer facilities and surely not such an impressive building as the one we're in tonight. It's a great pleasure to be back, but in a different capacity to be sure. Let me start by making two comments on the introduction, for which I am very grateful and very flattered. I remember when I first got to Greece and uh, got involved in Greek politics. That was end of 63, beginning of 64, uh, when the establishment, as I finally got to call it, used to attack me for very radical positions. I used to say to them, but you know, uh, I've spent some time in California, I was chairman in California, you know, how, you know, that was a title, uh, you know, to, to save me from the attacks of the establishment. Lo and behold, of course, Berkeley blew up a little later, and they said, didn't we tell you? You were the cause of it all. But then the other thing that, I wanted to mention is this, that the title of this speech, this talk tonight, Toward a Totalitarian World, <clears throat> I'm afraid is not in danger of being untopical or non-topical. The evidence is piling rather too fast and too surprisingly for it to be not a very substantive question. And the only question now, in my mind, is whether we should or we should not retain a question mark at the end of the expression toward a totalitarian world. I do not wish to be Cassandra or a pessimist, for I believe in action. And if you are really pessimistic, then you move toward some kind of fatalism and you give up. We must retain enough optimism for action, but no more than that, for no more, I think, is justified. It is very clear to many of us, surely not only to me, that for a long time now, we have been living in a enveloping nightmare, a nightmare that has been best described by people like Kafka and possibly Orwell, or the new novel should be some kind of combination of Kafka and of Orwell, and that may not be enough. And it is very difficult to say that anybody knows the beginning when historians pick dates. They do a very risky thing. And I'm not prepared to pick a date. I do not know. But I do know that if one has to maybe pick a date, a reasonably legitimate one might be the last world war especially the end of the last world war. And if want, uh, one wants uh, really the, uh, an accent, the first obvious and clear symptom of the nightmare, unquestionable and unchallengeable, 
That one, I think, is Greece, 1967. I see Greece, the events in Greece, I have come to see them as part of an unfolding drama that has enveloped us all, whether we live in the United States or in Canada or in Europe or in Africa or in Asia. And I do not wish to impress you with any attempt at a very deep explanation, for I have none. But I shall try to point out what I think are some very significant aspects of this truly frightening process and raise some questions as to what are some possible courses of action for the citizen of the world, whether he is in Iowa or in Greece or in Canada or anywhere at all, what are the things to do, if any exist, that can prevent the materialization of this nightmare into everybody's everyday, everyday life. I shall start with Greece, because Greece I know well, and because my facts there are quite, I think, unchallengeable. And since I do not wish to spend the whole hour on Greece, but I would like to extract the implications of Greece and generalize a bit about all of us, Greeks and non-Greeks, pardon this very self-centered way of defining the world at this point. Uh, I would like to be brief about Greece. Telegraphic. Telegraphic. Greece has gone through, had gone through a civil war immediately after the last world war. A civil war that lasted from 44 to 49. That civil war brought the United States to Europe in a different sense than it had brought the United States in Europe in the first or in the last world war. It brought it in the form of an intervention for democracy. So it was the statement in any case, and there was much evidence in its support at the time. It is known as the Truman Doctrine. And Greece, you may not remember, was in fact the first Vietnam. And it was a successful Vietnam for the Greek government and for the United States. And it meant the defeat of the Communist Party in Greece and the National Liberation Front, which had been the main force against the Germans in Greece during the German occupation, the Axis occupation of Greece. It was the first time that uh, napalm bombs were used. It was the first time that the US guided an army, a foreign army, directed the economy of a foreign country toward an objective which was to prevent the takeover of Greece by the National Liberation Front, which indeed was led by the Communist Party of Greece. The National Liberation Front failed not so much because of the massive aid that the United States gave to Greece, over $3 billion were then spent, but primarily because Stalin had made an agreement with Churchill in Tehran on October 10, 1944, in which on a sheet of paper, very small, 
sheet of paper, Churchill had written down some numbers. Greece, 90% to Great Britain, 10% to the Soviet Union. Bulgaria, 90% to the Soviet Union, 10% to Great Britain. Yugoslavia, 50-50. And uh, Joseph Stalin initialed this, and Churchill said, well, maybe we shouldn't keep it. And Stalin said, no, you keep it. It'll be of some interest to you in the future. So Stalin kept it. I mean, Churchill kept it. And Stalin kept his word, but it is really rather amazing that I don't know what the 90% means exactly, but uh, I do know what the 50-50 of Yugoslavia means, and it has been respected. So Stalin did not support the National Liberation Force in Greece, uh, front in Greece. Uh, in fact, he referred to them as the brigands. Tito of Yugoslavia aided the Greek Liberation Front then. But uh, in 1949, he broke with Moscow. And when he did break with Moscow, he had expected that the Greek Communist Party also would break with Moscow, which it did not, even though not being helped by Moscow. It supported the Moscow line and attacked Tito. Supply lines were cut off, and the game for the Communist uh, National Liberation Front was lost. And this explains the relative ease with which it was defeated, or relative, because it cost a lot in human life and suffering. So the U.S. was in Greece early, and it took over as a tutor during the 50s. It helped shape its political life, its economic life. The United States of the 50s followed basically a policy that shifted from the Truman to the Eisenhower years from a policy of rather open support to democratic processes in Greece to a rather schematic approach. Schematic, I shall explain what this word means, what I want it to mean, of the right as government, the center, as we call it in Greece, as opposition to the right, and the left as non-existent. They developed a theory about what would stability mean in Greece, in Washington. And this concept was terribly important because the U.S. Embassy in Greece and the U.S. military mission in Greece and the CIA in Greece were very important in the 50s. And they shaped policy, which was that the conservatives should govern that the loyal progressives should be strong enough in parliament to be in opposition, and that the left should be just not present. It is not necessary to have the left at all. And in order to guarantee this security after the Civil War, in the context of a democratic process, there was much intervention in the political life of Greece much intervention that, in fact, took the form even of the militaries intervening in elections. And for those of you who have seen the film Z, or Z as we call it in Greek, events that are portrayed there took place in 1963. That's before the coup, of course. It took the form, in fact, of developing a para-governmental, para-military structure, a parallel government, not a shadow government, but a parallel government in Greece, intended to safeguard Greece from the vagaries of the political process. It was a structure that went through the armed forces, the intelligence services, and the Greek bureaucracy. It responded to commands from the palace, from the U.S. missions or services in Greece. And this machine was intended to guarantee 
that the basic structure of Greek commitments to the alliance, NATO, and the basically secondary role of the left and the radicals in Greece would go unchallenged. It is the time that I entered politics when somehow the wounds of the Civil War had been more or less healed, when we could look forward to building a new Greece without permitting the dreams of the past to haunt us, and we wanted to lay to rest the divisions among the Greeks between those who had been in at this side of the Civil War and those who had been on that side of the Civil War, and go forward to build a democratic and progressive Greek society. And uh, these slogans appealed a great deal to the Greek people. We wanted political democracy. We wanted, as we said, the king to reign, but the people to rule. We wanted the Greek army to belong to Greece, and we wanted Greece to belong to the Greeks. Very simple, you might say even demagogic slogans, but they had meaning for us. And we won a very, very meaningful victory of 53%, unique in Greek history, modern Greek history, and we started building only to find out very early that we ran smack into what we came around to calling the establishment. The establishment in Greece was this structure of power that I refer to the parallel government that had been built a long time before. And it was headed up at the top by the palace, the U.S services in Greece, and a small coterie of very large, by Greek standards, uh, basically foreign business enterprises. We had difficulty on all fronts. We discovered that it was impossible to really affect the structure of the armed forces or the intelligence forces. And I shall give you one concrete example and move as fast as I can, for Greece is not my topic, the key topic tonight. I became minister to the prime minister, and I was in charge, unfortunately, of the intelligence forces of Greece. And I called upon our newly appointed head, a general, and I asked him for a favor. I said, I don't know how much you can control these forces, but do please make sure that they stop tapping my telephones and the telephones of the other ministers. After all, they are supposed to be our intelligence services. He came back a little later. He said, can't do it. Can't do it because the services are both administered and financed directly by the US CIA, and I have no control. I brought the problem before the cabinet. It was very early in our government. And I said, well, what do we do about this? And the answer was that joint answer. I share in it myself. Otherwise, I should have resigned. That it was really too big an issue, and it was too early in our life as a government to take it up, that it should be shelved for the time and taken up a bit later with Washington. Other things intervened in the meantime, such as the Cyprus crisis, which did not permit us really to reach to that question. And we were in heavy seas very soon as we tried to develop some civilian control over the armed forces. We discovered ourselves ousted from government, despite the 53 percent, despite the majority in parliament. And we discovered ourselves again campaigning for new elections, elections which would eventually have taken place in May 1967, but which did not take place. And they did not take place because we would have won these elections, and we would have made good on some of these commitments to the Greek people. The colonels beat us to the punch, 
and established in Greece as oppressive a regime as Greece has ever seen. Two things about the colonels. One, are they as oppressive as all that? And two, who are they? How oppressive they are has been established by an objective authority. It is the Human Rights Commission in Europe, and it is the Council of Europe as well. In December 1969, after two years of careful investigation and despite fantastic pressures not to do so, they found that Greece had violated all precepts of democratic government from the level of personal liberty to the level of democratic political process, and two, that it was a government that ruled by organized and planned terror and torture. And the torture part was documented very substantially in a 1,200-page report, which was accepted by all Western European governments that belong in the Council of Europe, with the exception of Greece and Cyprus, which could not do otherwise. But who are the colonels? Five men made the coup. I don't call it a revolution. We don't call it a revolution. It is a mafia. It is an armed mafia with modern technology and modern means of control over the army and through the army over the nation as a whole. It is a coup. It is an intelligent coup. And it is intelligent in two senses, that it is intelligent and that it comes from the intelligence. It is the first computerized coup that I know about. There may have been others. But the coup was run by tape. And the computer who ran the computer specialist, the operator, programmer, is a man I know, a graduate of MIT, a Greek, who was forced to run the tapes through the program. He cannot yet speak, but he will. He is not in a position at this moment for other obvious reasons, but at some point he will be able to. Who are the men? There were five in the coup. The men who made the coup were five. One of them is the man who is dictator today, Papadopoulos. He gives the key, the clue, to the coup. He's a man who hasn't fought. He's an intelligence officer. During the occupation of Greece, he was a collaborator of the Germans. He was a collaborator of the SS, as reported in Washington Post of a date that I do not remember. Papadopoulos, during the 50s, was the official liaison between the Greek intelligence services and the American CIA. He is the number one CIA Greek in Greece. And so the coup can be called straightforwardly as the coup which put for the first time in Europe an operative of the CIA to the position of prime minister. Who are the others? One is Colonel Rufo Gadis. He was the personnel officer of the Greek intelligence services the night of the coup. The other is Colonel Makarezos. He was the intelligence officer of the Greek intelligence services the night of the coup. And the fourth one was General Hadzipetro, commander of the missile NATO base in Crete. The only man who did not have any of these special relations is Patakos, who was an accident, but a rather important one because he had the tanks. 
So these are the five men that made the coup. The coup was decided upon in February in Washington. There was a subcommittee of the Security Council headed by W.W. W. Rostow. The evidence was reviewed on Greece and Rostow concluded that, gentlemen, what has been said today, or rather what has not been said, makes the course of events in Greece inevitable. This is from official Washington reporting, confirmed and factual. How strong the support of the Pentagon and the intelligence services of this country to the regime are or is, I think can be established very simply by looking at the sequence of the following events. In December 1969, Western Europe decides to oust the colonels from the Council of Europe as anathema to Western European culture. By September 1970, that's a few months later, the US government announces the full resumption of military aid to the Greek colonels without strings attached. So the colonels now have become the bastion of the free world, despite the fact that Western Europe has condemned them as a barbaric, oppressive, undemocratic, totalitarian regime. And this happens, this Washington decision is taken by the administration in the presence of 42 senators saying no and eight senators obtaining. The U.S. Senate voted on the Hartke Amendment to the Cambodian Bill. Forty-two senators voted with Senator Hartke that military aid to Greece should be stopped immediately. Eight abstained and 50 voted against the Hartke Amendment. The Nixon administration decided to go forward, give its full support to the colonels, with a divided Senate. with a weak voice to be sure, but protested the next day. Among the Europeans, the countries that have had a voice for freedom and democracy this period are few, and they should be mentioned. They are Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Italy to the extent that it can, for it is itself in danger of imminent totalitarianism, and partly Holland. Germany and England and France voted for the ouster of Greece from the Council of Europe, and for this we are grateful. But we must express, just as we express our disappointment in Washington policy, we must express our disappointment in the lack of courage on the part of those great European countries, which do not find it within themselves to say no to what amounts to a return of totalitarianism in its darkest form in West Europe. We fought the last war, we thought, to end totalitarianism. 
I'm afraid what we have done to a large extent is to eliminate two contestants for a totalitarian world. And I'm afraid forces have developing today in the world that threaten to accomplish the same objective. But enough about Greece itself. Greece is a symptom. It is a part of a much larger image. There is, for instance, Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was invaded in a very brutal way by the forces of the Warsaw Pact. And the question is, why? Why was Dubček a threat to the Soviet Union? Why were we, the democratic forces of Greece, a threat to the United States? The two questions are one and the same. They are not different. And unless we can understand the logic of the Czech invasion or the Pentagon's support for the coup in Greece, we don't have the key to our period. And I have truly and honestly been trying to understand, at least for myself, what could be the logic of these acts. I have a conclusion, a tentative conclusion, and I will lay it before you without any adornment. In order to understand it, I had to play act, to take on a role, to ask myself, suppose you were not Andreas Papandreou, but you were Warren Nutter or W.W. W. Rosto or some kind of general or admiral in the Pentagon in the Security Council, put on those glasses and look at Greece. Well, let us say that I am one of those generals, and I personify the role of a security manager for this great nation and for the West. What would I say about events in Greece? What dangers would I see? I would know that in May 1967, the Centre Union Party and the Papandreou's would win. I know that they would follow a more progressive social economic policy, let's even call it the favorite word of Time magazine, leftist. So what? Would they be leaving the Greeks NATO? No. The Center Union Party had never raised the question of leaving or staying in NATO. So Greeks, Greece would remain a member of the alliance. There would be, of course, a little more bargaining by the Greeks. The Greeks would no longer be yes men. They would refuse to be satellites. They would insist what limits does arrogance have to be allies. They would insist on being allies, but not satellites. And I would ask myself, well, what does this do to me, the security manager? Does it hurt our strategic interests? And in what way does it hurt those interests? And having searched my soul, and being a military soul, please keep that in mind, I'm playing this role now, I would say, yes, it would hurt our interests. Why? Greece is part of this object, let's call it geosphere, part of the world, 
which today does not even place the limits to our strategic power because we have space, outer space as well. And on this geosphere, there is a little spot called Greece, which turns out by bad luck to be terribly important, has been terribly important in many phases of history. And it's terribly important now because it's the place where East meets West, where Europe meets the Middle East and Africa. It's the Eastern Mediterranean where we have the Russian fleet, the hostile North African ports, the Arab-Israel conflict, Greece is terribly important. And what do I want in Greece or from Greece? I want the supply bases in Crete for the Sixth Fleet. I want the missile bases in Crete, nuclear missile bases. I want the jamming stations to block the voice of truth when I want to. I want Athens as my counter espionage and espionage center for the North. I want Athens as my Air Force stopover. I want Greek ports for my Sixth Fleet. I want the island of Corfu transformed to a NATO base. Well, if all these things are important to me, I can then ask myself the question, I'm the militarist now, tomorrow there are elections in Greece, in Parliament the Papandreou's have won, but let's say not, they, the right won, let's say the right wins. And I ask for these extensions of Greece's participation in the alliance. I ask for the missile bases, and I ask for the strategic weapons, and I ask for the ports, and for the supply, and for this, and for that, and for the other. Am I sure I will get them? And the answer is no. I can't be sure that I will get them. Because there is such a thing as the people's will in a democracy. Because the deputies that are elected from this village and from that town may one day come to Greek parliament and say, no, we won't have a missile base in Crete. We want to be allies, yes. But we, the Greek people, do not feel like having missile bases or making this the great fortress for the West or for any kind of collection of nations. We didn't think of this land of ours as the vanguard of any bloc. We joined the Alliance for Security to preserve our independence and our traditions and our democratic processes, but not to offer ourselves on the altar of Armageddon. And since I know this is the case, I would say freedom and democracy in Greece is a luxury. It must go. Or if it goes, I will not help it return. For the security manager of this age is really the planner par excellence. He is the computerized modern programmer planner who has charge of the security of the nation, and in the case of the United States or of the Soviet Union, of the security of the superpower and indeed of the whole bloc to which the superpowers belong. There has emerged then something with a division of the world into two blocks that we may well call imperial militarism. For there are indeed the two empires, the two blocks, east and west. And they have an apex, Moscow and Washington. 
And you would expect, I suppose, that with the passing of time, Moscow and Washington would tend to feel rather hostile toward each other. But that's not at all what is happening. Quite the contrary. Despite the rhetoric, despite the use of the word communist in the United States, or the word imperialist in the Soviet Union, the national security managers of the US feel comfortable only in the presence of the national security managers of the Soviet Union, for they speak the same language. And as Richard Barnett has said in a very apt phrase, the competition between the national security managers of the United States with those of the Soviet Union resembles that between Ford and General Motors. The game is played with rules that are observed quite closely. The game is played in the context of what is called peaceful coexistence, once in a while threatened here and there, but basically respected. This peaceful coexistence means, first, where there has been an equilibrium already arrived at and defined, as is the case with Europe. Then that equilibrium is to be respected by both. Example, the Soviet Union is one of the closest supporters that the colonels in Greece have today. The Soviet bloc is truly aiding the military junta in Greece. Fact, commercial treaties, visits, honors, athletic events, participation, everything. Why? Because by respecting the presence of this military regime and the implications of U.S. military presence there, it respects the status quo in Europe, which at the same time means that the United States will respect the Soviet presence in Czechoslovakia and will raise no questions about it. And this process permits each of the superpowers to increase its control over its allies or satellites. You know, all nations were born equal, but some more equal than others, to try to use this about nations. So what is a satellite and what is an ally is a rather thin line. But then there are the areas where there is indeed conflict. And such a conflict is, for instance, Vietnam. There the conflict is much more complex. There is a definition. Each of the superpowers attempts a definition of its relative power in Southeast Asia. The Soviet Union is aiding materially their side. The US is aiding materially and by manpower their side. And then, of course, the game is more complex because it is one of the areas where a emerging third superpower is also interested and committed. And may I give you just an inkling of a view that I hold about the course of the Vietnam War? I think that the U.S. extension of the war into Cambodia had primarily the objective of getting the Chinese through Sihanouk much more involved and thus 
making it less interesting and palatable for the Soviet Union to support North Vietnam to the extent it has been supporting it up to now. But this is just a guess in this terrible chess game that costs human lives and more than human lives undermines the foundations of whatever culture we have managed to build for ourselves. Now this militarism, this imperial militarism, which has imperialist dimensions on both sides as well, but I'm less interested now in the economics of this and more in the political aspects of it, this militarism that emanates from the two superpowers has spectacular implications for all the nations that belong to the two blocs and has implications for the superpowers themselves, the United States and the Soviet Union. The military in each of the blocs has formed a club. Let us call it the National Security Club of the West and the National Security Club of the East. I wish to assert that this club in the West called NATO and in the East called the Warsaw Pact is far more powerful politically than any of the governments of the West and correspondingly any of the governments of the East. The apex, of course, in both cases is the capital of the corresponding superpower. The Pentagon, obviously, is big boss in the West and the Kremlin big boss in the East. But the military, this international alliance of military, men of security managers, increasingly tend to think of the policies of the, their governments, their national governments, be it the Dutch government, the Norwegian government, the Italian government, the Belgian government, increasingly to think of them as short-sighted, as not capable of comprehending the broad scenario, to use a phrase, which ought to be played they, the military men, educated in the task of preserving the social order, the empire, let us say, know best, have more information. And after all, these governments come and go, don't they? These governments come and go. A prime minister is here today and gone tomorrow. The bureaucracy is there. They are the trustees of the nation. And why should one pay much attention to what a senator from Minnesota or a congressman from New York may have to say? After all, he represents a partial interest of a region or a constituency. Even to inform him on matters that involve national security is not proper, is it? This is the way the thinking goes. And as the military planner thinks of the logistics of world war or world peace, use whatever word you wish, and as he thinks of all this and weapon systems and the rate of obsolescence of weapon systems and the budget needs for supporting these weapon systems, he also has to come around to asking a very simple question. How long will the people of Belgium, of Italy, of Greece, of the United States. Continue to be willing to foot the bill, to send people to war, and to support the armaments game. It's rather important that they are made to understand what's good for the nation. And then it is clear that we must have, of course, then our propaganda machine at work. And a very substantial part of what is called 
the national defense budget goes to propaganda. Over $3 billion goes to intelligence in this budget. And a great deal of that goes to buy politicians. In Greece, the price was $250,000 at a critical moment in the Greek parliament. And then, of course, more than that, you have to make sure that the representatives of the people are the right representatives of the people. You should make sure that in the November elections here or in the December elections there, the right kind of people go to Parliament or to Congress, as the case may be. And you have there the makings of an internal totalitarianism, which is only a reflection of and an extension of the outward-looking totalitarianism, the expansionism of the imperial militarism that I'm talking about. Finally, there is another and even more frightening dimension, even frightening to those of us who believe in the democratic process proper, as I do and as I'm sure you do. These events of the last 25 years have concentrated in the hands of governments in general tremendous power. It used to be, you know, the liberals' desire and wish and motif. More power to the government to stamp out racial inequality, income inequality, the key was the government. And this Leviathan, the central government, which has grown by leaps and bounds mostly because of the challenge to national security. Governments have grown terribly powerful during the era of the Cold War. This government now in a democratic society has to resolve the problems of a variety of minorities defined in different ways in different situations in different countries. Let me become myself more clear. There is a general argument in a democratic society if you don't like something, you change it. And you change it by making use of the freedoms provided by the Bill of Rights and your vote. And this is something in which I believe and something for which I am fighting and will continue to fight. <laughs> but we have to recognize that a problem has arisen that requires a democratic solution, not a totalitarian solution, for that's easy. And the problem is the following. With the rising consciousness of the citizenry, rising standard of living, here and elsewhere, with a concentration of power in the hands of the state, there are not individuals, but groups identified either by color or by origin or by race or by ethnic origin in many parts of the world that feel frustrated because the vote for them to be heard, they are not members of the establishment, they are disestablished. I'm talking about the disestablished minorities. There are many kinds in many parts of the world. The disestablished minorities, unfortunately, cannot effectively, through the majority rule, resolve the problem of their fate, unless the majority 
were to identify with them, to accept them and recognize them as equal. Something that has not happened in many situations, in many countries, in many times. So there is a tendency, of course, on the part of those minorities, that is, groups of people that can be identified by some characteristic, whatever it may be, to become terribly frustrated by a combination of two things, or two or three things. That they are disestablished, one. Two, that the state now does have the power to resolve problems which it may not have had in the past because of the concentration of power in the hands of the state. And third, that the democratic process, which seems to resolve so many problems, does not seem quite to resolve that one. That also becomes enmeshed, that type of problem, in the general pattern of oppressive tactics on the part of governments that are influenced deeply by security, stability, and imperial considerations, militaristic considerations. A very easy way to resolve this is to stamp it out by militant action. To hit at the minorities, to stamp them out. That's fascism, of course, as we remember it. And there is danger of that. We who recognize the need for democratic solutions to all problems, what have we got to offer? I think, first of all, we have to offer honesty to the disestablished minority. We should not shrug our shoulders and say, you've got the balloting box, the booth. If we are true Democrats, we have to remember that that may be no solution for him. And that means, in fact, that we have to in honesty and in candor, ask ourselves in each nation and its community, what processes must be added on to whatever processes democratic we have now to guarantee that the voice of the disestablished will be heard? There is much little thinking, very little thinking about this. Very few experiments. To say that we are one is beginning to sound hollow, as the minorities themselves are telling us. We should be one, and hopefully we will be one someday. But until we, each one of us in our hearts feel that we are one, we should be honest and say, what are the problems of yours, or yours, or my disestablished minority? And how can they be faced by a nation in all candor, and in equity, and in freedom? I mention this last because it may well turn out to be important, very important, in the North American continent, more so possibly than it is in Europe today although it was there, too, in the past. And I mention it because it is one of the problems that may kindle the fires of imperial militarism that threatens to the very foundations our society in the broadest sense. And having said all this, and having been such a Cassandra, do I see a road the forces that are acting for freedom and for democracy and for human dignity are very scattered forces. We do not have armies, and we do not have governments. We are everywhere, badly disorganized, 
badly understanding what is happening to us without media to affect public opinion, without prime television time, without the press. And I give one example, a pathetic example, that I gave this afternoon. I'd like to repeat it tonight. We're having such great difficulty in this little Greek movement for freedom to get our news into press. One member of our movement, a Greek student by the name of Yorogakis, in Genova, last month, 23 years old, decided to bring the attention of the world on the Greek problem. And he went to the central square of Genova and burned himself to death. And with the exception of Italy, Italian press, and Scandinavian press, there was hardly notice in any of the great newspapers of the world there were three lines in the ninth page in the newspaper of the city where I live. And one could almost say the horrible thing, at least for what he had intended it, his death was in vain. But not for us, for he has set a very big example to Greek youth. By his death, he has told them, that they must sacrifice. He has told them that freedom and human dignity are not gifts, that they are conquests to be prized and to be fought for. And I'm afraid that really this is the message through his act that I want to pass on to you as my own commitment. We are too scattered and too disorganized, those who fight for freedom, to talk about clear-cut strategies. But we are many. And each of us should look into himself and decide how much he can do for the cause of freedom that takes different forms in different places at different times. Above all, he must decide that he should risk. He should risk being unpleasant. He should risk security. He should risk occasionally even more than that. But without that, and without a growing commitment on the part of the citizen and especially on the part of youth to the fight for the preservation and the expansion of freedom. Freedom for our generation will die. And it'll die for you the way it died for us. And it'll die for more than a generation. For it isn't now Nazi Germany and Hirohito's Japan it is now two superpowers with modern technology that surpasses human imagination, with powerful military and intelligence establishments that can do many things that we cannot even imagine. And if, if the world really were to be airtightly held, 
by those two groups or three groups, how many they may be, of security managers, I think Orwell will come true. And all of us will live in Kafka's novels. Thank you very much. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Andreas Pompandreou, professor of economics at York University, Toronto, and a former official in his father's Greek government, spoke on the political situation in Greece. University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.